Okay, wait for the last few folks to get in here. I really appreciate everyone coming. Good evening. My name is Teresa Klein, and I'm a member of the organizing committee for the Coastal Bend Social Forum, as well as a faculty member here at Del Mar College. Um, before we get started, I'd like to welcome some of our out-of-town visitors. We have some um, students from Donna High School, is that correct, right there? We've got some students from Far San Juan Alamo, right there. All right, and what other student groups do we have? What other student group? Any others? Student groups? Southwest. Southwest, all right. Okay, very good. Well, welcome. Welcome to Del Mar College. Um, I know that because of the weather, some of the students from other college or other schools could not make it. And I know we're doing a live stream tonight, so I'd like to do a shout out especially to the students from Eagle Pass who couldn't make it over here because of the weather. So let's give them a round of applause. Hey, Eagle Pass. And we also have, we also have the students from South Texas College who could not make it up here as well. So shout out to South Texas College, everyone. Yes. At this time, I would like to introduce Teresa, Ms. Teresa Saldivar. She is a teacher in our Spanish lab and a community dance instructor. And she would like to say a couple words to us and then perform a dance that she has prepared, especially for our speaker tonight. Good evening. Thank you, Dolores Huerta, for your presence, blessing us today. We welcome you to our sparkling city and hope you truly enjoy your stay. Tonight, I will be dancing a version of La Llorona, minus my mask, in order to celebrate in this sacred time of year, remembering all who have passed away but live in our hearts. According to Mystic Encounters, the author Q. L. Pierce, La Llorona can be seen as a tragic or fearsome ghost, but researchers have a new view of her. The legend is a symbol of a woman's resistance to male control in the family and in society, making her own decisions and acting upon them. She was not willing to be quiet and do what society said she had to do. The researchers see La Llorona as a very powerful figure. Tonight, I will also be dancing two songs from the state of Veracruz, Mexico, where the songs reflect unity, friendship, and collaboration by mere grace. The spirit of Veracruz is truly carnaval, or a fiesta. And tonight, we celebrate you, Dolores Huerta, for your bravery to help make all individuals be equal and of worth. May we as people and educators in different arenas learn from your nonviolent, courageous spirit to face head on the many painful realities of our current communities. Our children and our families and in our world, here in our city, in a nation, need strong leaders more than ever. And you give us hope and light to continue on in this life and be a voice. Thank you for coming out tonight. And thank you, Maestra Dolores Huerta, for your many efforts, contributions, and life lessons.
Vienen las flores, llorona, las flores del campo santo. No sé qué tienen las flores, llorona, las flores del campo santo. Que cuando las mueve el viento, llorona, parece que están llorando. Que cuando las mueve el viento, llorona, parece que
What a beautiful performance. <laughs> Events like this take a lot of coordination, and we have a lot of sponsors for the event. And so I wanted just to give, take a moment to um, give, you, give those folks some credit. Um, tonight's events are not sponsored by big corporations. They're sponsored by groups. They're sponsored by... <laughs> The Del Mar College Department of Social Sciences. The Del Mar College Mexican American Studies Program. The Del Mar College Title V Office. The Texas Association of Chicanos in Higher Education. The Texas Association of Black Personnel in Higher Education. And the Del Mar College Office of the President. We also have Texas A&M University, the uh, Provost and College of Liberal Arts, the A&M University of Corpus Christi. <laughs> Texas A&M University, Kingsville. <laughs> All right. The Coastal Bend Labor Council. Do we have anyone from labor here? <laughs> Woo, good. Senator Juan Chuy Anahosa. Representative Abel Herrero. Mrs. Janet and Dr. Juan Felipe Santos, and the Center for Progressive Studies and Culture. And let's give them all a round of applause. The other thing is this event tonight is part of a two-day event called the Coastal Bend Social Forum, where we have people from various organizations are, gonna are going to come to talk about how we change our worlds through our actions. This event happens every two years, and this is the first time that we have hosted it here at Del Mar College, so thank you to Del Mar College for that. One person has been instrumental in making this event a success, and that's our college president, Dr. Mark Escamilla. It's because of him that we have had such magnificent support for bringing Ms. Huerta and all the speakers we'll hear from tomorrow, and I'd like to bring him up to say a few words. Would. Where is that destiny? Good evening. What a beautiful crowd this is. Thank you, Dr. Klein, and thank you to everyone who have come who's come out tonight to celebrate the life's work of Ms. Dolores Huerta. I've had the pleasure to speak with her this afternoon and a little bit this evening, but I was compelled to just talk about stories, stories that I was uh, brought up with, with my parents, um, especially my father and my grandparents who were uh, farm workers, and I just was compelled to talk about those wonderful times and those difficult times, but the, the, nevertheless, the times that shaped uh, my forefathers and my parents and, and, uh, and the effects that it's had on, on my life. 
Uh, I can go on and on, but that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to welcome you all but, uh, uh, to this wonderful occasion. I want to thank, again, the groups. Dr. Klein, let, let's, let's give our hand for Dr. Klein. Teresa gave me way too much credit for this. She came to my office one day and said, Mark, this is where we need to go. I said, let's go, Teresa. We're following you, and we're going to get this thing done. And you did in a remarkable fashion. Thank you so much. For all those who have traveled here from the Valle, from what are other parts of Texas, thank you, thank you, thank you. To our brothers and sisters from all over, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. To the elected officials who are here, I know we have Representative Abel Herrero who's here and trustees from, uh, Trustee Diaz from the Corpus Christi School District and all the others that I can't see right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your service to our community. And finally, just on behalf of the Board of Regents, on behalf of our students, our faculty, our staff, administration, everyone at Del Mar College, welcome. Thank you. Again, the, Coastal Bend Forum, um, the 2015 Coastal Bend Social Forum will not end tonight. In fact, it's just beginning. We're going to be um, going tomorrow again at 9 a.m. over at the Wolf Recital Hall, weather permitting. And I just want to make a quick announcement because of the weather that we're expecting to come in. If you'd like to join us tomorrow, there's a list of the topics that are going to be discussed on the back of your program. Um, but if you want to check if we're having any weather events, um, you can check the Del Mar College Facebook page or the 2015 Coastal Bend Forum Facebook page as well, and we'll be posting any changes that we may have on that. Um, our first panel tomorrow is going to include Dolores Huerta, and it is going to also include folks from labor, including um, some of the folks who have worked in the state AFL-CIO, as well as some of our local labor leaders. We are privileged to have a thriving labor community in the Coastal Bend. Part of this is the result of the work of the local Coastal Bend Labor Council. And I'm pleased to announce that we have the president of the Coastal Bend Labor Council with us tonight, Ms. Christy Veith. Let's give her a hand. Come on. Thank you all. Uh, first of all, let me apologize for being before you in flip-flops. My daughter had her first uh, high school varsity swim meet today, and if any of you are familiar with swim meets, they are very long, and she was injured, and I'm running behind, but bless her heart, she was injured, and she still came in second place, so, and that, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be in flip-flops, and also for those of you that give me a hug later, uh, my special perfume tonight is chlorine, just so you know. Uh, it is such an honor to be able to share this evening with you all. I'm so fortunate to have the opportunity to welcome you all as friends of our community on behalf of labor. This evening, we have a speaker. She's dynamic, she is fearless, and she's also a historically recognized labor woman. I myself am the daughter of a mother who was in the fight for workers' justice. And if any of you remember, there was a boycott for grapes. I do not believe I had grapes until I was about 10 years old. There was blood on those grapes. There was blood on those grapes in Dolores Huerta. She was fighting out in the fields, and we were to support her boycott and support the farm workers. And let me just say, if any of you know my mother, some of you do, Heaven help the family member if we walked into their house and there was grapes on the counter. <laughs> Many of us have not met Sister Dolores Huerta personally, but we have seen her in storybooks and documentaries, and we've heard of her struggle of the farm worker families, and she is legendary. She has taught us that we struggle together, so we should fight and advocate together. However, it is sad and unfortunate that today's students will not read and learn of her struggle for these workers because the Texas Education Agency has approved te textbooks that do not think that these struggles were real or historic, much less worthy of a classroom discussion. So when our state agencies disguise slavery as immigrant, as immigrant workers on a guest worker program, 
seeking manual labor, there's a problem. There is a problem. When immigrant workers are treated as slaves and they're already lower than legal wages are withheld from them, there is a problem. But Sister Dolores Huerta, she is our beacon to the past, and she is still our path to progress. Today, the Coastal Bend Labor Council and our affiliated unions, we continue the fight for good jobs in our community, jobs that treat workers with dignity, jobs that are safe and are healthy, jobs that pay fair wages and help to extend the right of workers to form unions and through their unions to speak out for organized workers and for non-organized workers. They deserve the same opportunity on the job for a better future for all our families. And we are proud to have cultivated these principles from her. Thank you so much, Sister Huerta, for giving us a lifetime of advocacy. And thank you for sharing this night with labor families, with professional educators, concerned citizens, and most of all, our students. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Sister Huerta, and please enjoy your evening. All right. At the end of the talk tonight, I just want to let you know, we are, we are going to have some question and answer, but we're going to be doing it a little bit differently. Um, would Dr. Barrett and Dr. Klein wave their hands? They are right here. They have cards with them, and if you have a question, I want you to wave them down. They'll be going around. Yep, there they are. You can see them both standing there. If you have a question, you just need to write the question on the card, and then wave to them and they will come and pick them up. We might get a couple other volunteers who might help with that as well. And we will ask some of the questions at the end of the, of the evening, okay? All right, I'd like to at this time introduce um, Mrs. Or Dr. Isabella Riza, Professor of Sociology from Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out. This is so exciting. This is a dream come true for me. Like, this is one of the things that's on my bucket list, so I'm so excited to have had the opportunity to meet um, Ms. Ms. Huerta. Uh, we do the Coastal Bend Social Forum every two years. This is the fifth year that uh, we've held the forum, and prior to every forum, we go through a kind of ritual of um, talking, in a, you know, we sit around in a circle and we talk about, well, if we could have our druthers, like we, when we were dreaming big and there isn't a budget and those kinds of things, we throw out names. And typically we have three tiers of, um, of names that we, uh, that we contemplate. And this year when we started at the top, you know, it was like, well, who would we like to get? If we could get anybody, who could we get? And, um, Dolores Huerta came out of my mouth. And it was just one of those things where I, it, it's, it was such a, just a fantasy um, that to actually, to actually say it, to articulate it was just a little bit, made me a little bit, um, I, I felt silly, uh, just because it seemed like just un, unfathomable on some level. Um, but really, what, what did I learn? The worst thing that could happen is that they could say no and then we would go to the next person. <laughs> and, uh, but this time she said, yes. she said yes. We asked, and she said yes. And so here we are, and it was such a big lesson that you, all you, the starting point of change is imagining the possibilities, right? So, and, and articulating them, and I'm just so grateful to be here. I'm so grateful to have you um, in our presence and um, to hear what you have to say. And so welcome and thank you, and um, I'm gonna, introduce her now. So I just had to say that. I had to get that off of my chest. Okay, here we go. Um, Dolores Huerta is a labor legend and civil rights activist who founded the Dolores Huerta Foundation and co-founded the National Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers. 
Ms. Huerta has received numerous awards for her community service and advocacy for workers, immigrants, and women's rights. Among these awards are the Eugene B. Debs Foundation Outstanding American Award, the United States Presidential Eleanor Roosevelt Award for Human Rights, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. As a role model and living legend to many, Dolores Huerta has become a leader a leader, to efforts, a leader of efforts to improve the Latino, labor, and LGBT communities. And so with that, I'd like to welcome Ms. Dolores Huerta. It's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just uh, want to thank everybody who made it possible for me to be here. Uh, Dr. Scamilla, the president here. Uh, of course, uh, so many of you that have been responsible for Am I, am I coming here? And I do want to name them because I think I want you to all give them a big applause. Uh, of course, Isabel uh, Ariaga, who, Ariaga, who uh, just introduced me, uh, Joy Miller, uh, Dawson Barrett, uh, Teresa Klein, who we heard from earlier today, and uh, Jim Klein, uh, Kirby Orius, I hope I'm saying this name right, uh, Jamalia uh, Tigver, and Mariah, Mariah Bohr, Boone, I'm sorry, Mariah Boone, and uh, uh, of course, I also want to say the College Relations Office uh, at Rosalinda Reynoso and Liz Flores from the Mexican American Studies. And I want to thank all of you that came from a distance to be here. And we'll hope that everybody gets home safely today. So a big applause, please, for all of the folks that made it possible for me to be here today. And if we could have another applause for our wonderful dancer. Uh, for Teresa Saldivar, who uh, graced us with her performance. And I loved uh, what she said when she was introducing her dance about La Llorona. Uh, of course, a lot of us in the Latino uh, culture, we know who La Llorona is, right? Because we were all scared of her when we were kids, you know? Our parents used to tell her about La Llorona to make sure we would behave. Uh, but what she was saying about uh, the, uh, the voices that we need and that our voices need to be heard and I think that's what the social forum is all about uh, because it's time, Texas, okay? <laughs> it's time, Texas, that our voices be heard. And I, before I go into it, I just, because I, I always forget to do this, but uh, you heard uh, the introduction uh, that I am the uh, current president and the founder of the Dolores Huerta Foundation and we do grassroots organizing and I'll be talking a little bit more about that and you can look us up on the internet on DoloresHuerta.org D-O-L-O-R-E-S Huerta.org to uh, uh, learn more about the work that we are doing and it was wonderful to hear of course uh, from our labor leaders here uh, because you know people especially in Texas we know that we have what we call a right to work state which really means right to work for low wages right and like to right to work with with few benefits and and that is so important and I think I'll start there uh, but you know it's also I was the co-founder of the United Farm Workers with Cesar Chavez I mean he rest in peace and uh, you know, uh, farm workers didn't have the types of benefits that other workers had uh, going back to the early 30s when they passed the National Labor Relations Act and they left the farm workers out of that act. And it was interesting because the reason that they left the farm workers out of that national law was, guess why? Because they were Mexicans and blacks. And that was the express reason why they were left out of that, out of that labor law. And so that was back, passed way back in the 30s. And so for all of those years, you know, from the 30s until the 1960s, farm workers were treated pretty much, as was said earlier, like slaves, unfortunately. And they didn't even have the basic, basic conditions that other workers have. And I'm gonna talk about those basic conditions because when we talk about what did we win for the farm workers, and when the farm workers, you ask them, and they will say one of the things that we got from the farm workers movement was Toilets, just toilets. I mean, if there's one way that you can dehumanize people is to make them 
uh, feel like they're not even human beings by not providing them a toilet in the fields, by not providing them cold drinking water with individual cups so that they can drink, or the kind of hand washing facilities that they needed to handle the food. And that, that is, of course, one of the things that we want for the farm workers. But then the other thing that we want for farm workers, I believe, is dignity, right? So that they could be recognized for the kind of work that they did. did the, the fact that the farm workers feed the nation. Yes, Donald Trump. Some farm worker picked your food today. <laughs> Pick the food that you are eating today. Some undocumented farm worker probably picked your food out there today. And we have to constantly remind people because people forget because they're not connected with the people that provide them with their food. And I think that's one of the sad things that we here in the United States of America, that we do not honor the people that work with their hands, you know? In our school books, we're taught about the Fords and the Mellons and the Carnegies and all those uh, millionaires. But when you think of the people that really built the nation, it's the people that work with their hands, you know? The farm workers who feed us, uh, the people who make our clothes, who build our buildings, the carpenters, all of those people that do the hard work, the construction workers, they're the ones that build the nation, and yet we are not taught to honor them. And in fact, you know, sometimes I tell this story uh, to, especially to college students and high school students, and I say to them, if you had to be on a deserted island and you could only take one person with you, who would you take with you, an attorney or a farm worker? <laughs> My son Emilio, who's an attorney, doesn't like that joke, okay? And of course, if you had to take a, if you had to take a second person with you, who would you take? I think that would be a teacher, right? You would take a farm worker and a teacher. That's who you would take with you. And so when we think about the plight of farm workers and, and working people, how they're not respected, and we have to think of where does that come from? Where does that bigotry, where does that discrimination come from? And when we look back into our histories, we know that all of that racism and bigotry really comes uh, you know, from slavery, basically. Because way back in the day, you know, the, the whole thing, if you look back into ancient, ancient times, uh, racism didn't exist. I mean, the differences that people had were, are you a Christian or are you a pagan or something like that, but it had nothing to do with the color of your skin. But once we started getting our energy, uh, you know, from, from slavery, then of course, then it went to the color of people's skin, and that's kind of where that began. And of course, when we think of labor unions, you know, labor unions have tried to change that by making, it an, by making people understand that workers, if they come together in a, a labor organization, then they can advocate for themselves. And I like to say this when I come to Texas because a lot of times, I think even in some of our Texas school books, uh, the, uh, what labor has done for people isn't really understood. You know, number one, if it were not for labor unions, we wouldn't have a minimum wage we wouldn't have social security, we wouldn't have safety standards, we wouldn't have workers' compensation, you know, uh, and you know, something else that we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have uh, uh, public education because it were, la were labor unions that fought for public education. And the other thing is, if we did not have labor unions, we would not have a democracy because labor unions are the ones that built the middle class of the United States of America, and if you do not have a middle class, then you do not have a democracy. And so that kind of brings us uh, where we're at today. The other thing, let me say this, and I talk about the farm workers, and it wasn't until the farm workers were able to organize into an organization that became a labor union that we were able to make the changes uh, for the farm workers. So think about this, and we'll talk, say, I'll use the farm workers as an example. But here you have the boss, the employer, and he belongs to Western Growers, Farm Bureau Federation, the Chamber of Commerce. If he's a grape grower, Grape and uh, Tree Fruit League. If he's a cotton grower, the Cotton Growers League. Five or six different organizations. And they pay money to those organizations. They pay fees and they pay dues so that they can represent them at the state legislature or up in the Congress in Washington. Here's the farm worker. Farm worker only has one organization. Workers only have one organization, and that is their union, okay? Their union to represent them, not only on the job, but again, up in the Austin or up in the Congress. And they have to pay dues to that organization, to their union. But over here, the employers that have all these groups, okay, who needs an organization more? 
The worker or the employer? The worker, right? But what the employers do with all of their organizations, they don't want the labor unions to, co to collect dues from the workers through what they call a checkoff. Just like we get our taxes, you know, when we work, they, they deduct our taxes from our, from our paycheck. Well, this is the way that unions get the money for their organizations. So what right to work means is that the labor unions cannot get that checkoff. They cannot get that money uh, when they organize. And they need that money to be able to represent the workers. They also need the money, again, uh, to fight for them uh, in, in Sacramento, excuse me, well, here in Austin, or at the state legislature, or in the Congress, right? That's what they need that money for. So what right to work does, it makes it very, very difficult for the labor unions to survive. And I'm saying this because hopefully someday soon, in our near future, you here in this auditorium will be able to organize and say, we've got to get rid of the right to work laws, right? Because those laws, those right to work laws are the laws that really keep labor unions uh, from being able to survive and to increase uh, the wages. And if we look at our, uh, look at our political landscape, you know, when you look at the New York and uh, Pennsylvania and all of those cities on the East Coast, they're much more progressive. You look at California, also, Washington State, Oregon, they're much more progressive. They're kind of what they call the blue states. What do we have in California, besides all of the good laws that we passed, okay, which I'll talk about? What do we have in California that you don't have in Texas? We have labor unions, right? We have labor unions. And so that's why it's important, because basically, labor unions are about workers, organizations, and when people belong to an organization, they can get information, they can come together, and they can decide how they're going to be voting for different candidates, et cetera. So that's why labor is very, very important. And, and you know, when you hear some of those people on television and they'll say, well, workers don't really need unions anymore. I'm sorry, workers do need unions anymore. And when we talk about, for instance, just take the Farm Workers Union as an example. In California, we've been able to pass very, very good laws for the farm workers, for them to have the right to organize, for them to be able to get unemployment insurance, which in Texas they don't have, for farm workers to have good workers' compensation, which in most of the United States they, they don't have, for farm workers to get disability insurance, which in most of the United States they don't have. In fact, Carrie Kennedy, Senator Kennedy's daughter, has been trying to get some of the laws that we have in California in New York State for the last maybe 14, 15 years, and she can't get it passed, okay? Why? Because we are weak, right? And we have to be uh, organized, to, organized to be able to change some of those laws. And you know, some of the laws that we passed in California, and I'm just gonna mention a couple of them uh, to kind of let you know how laws that we passed in California actually help people in Texas, okay? Who knew? One of the laws that we passed, and we passed this law way back in 1961, and this is a law that we passed in an organization that we had before we started the United Farm Workers called the Community Service Organization. And what this law said is that you did not have to be a U.S. citizen to get public assistance. Before we passed that law, uh, you could not get public assistance unless you were a U.S. citizen. If you were a resident, uh, immigrant to the United States, if you had a green card, you couldn't get any of those laws. Well, we passed that law in California first. And now, today, throughout the United States of America, we have millions of people who are not U.S. citizens, but who were what they call legal immigrants, right? That have the tarjeta verde, they have the green card, that they can get public assistance, they can get Obamacare, right? They can get other kinds of assistances that before they couldn't get. Another law that we worked on, which I know many people here in Texas also were eligible, uh, the amnesty bill. Remember that bill in 1986? La amnistia que pasamos en el 86, okay? And by the way, I want to let people know that that was not Ronald Reagan that passed that law, okay? That was not Ronald Reagan. Actually, it was Senator Ted Kennedy who worked in the Senate. It was uh, uh, Peter Rodino in the House of Representatives, another man, Howard Berman, that we were able to pass that law in 1986. And under that law, we were able to get just the farm workers, 1,400,000 farm workers got their amnesty in 1986, okay? And we worked that bill, we in California worked that bill to make it pass. And I'm giving these examples because 
uh, we have to understand that we uh, have the power to be able to pass good legislation by being organized. You know, we were able to do it there in California. And when people think about the farm worker movement, part of the movement was, of course, organizing. And I think, by the way, this is what all labor unions do, is we get out there and we educate people about how important it is for them to vote. Because unless we are able to do that, we really can't change a lot of the conditions that exist uh, for us today. And, and when I think of Texas, I say, how did you guys elect Ted Cruz? Okay? I don't know. We'll talk, about it a, li we'll talk a little bit more about that later, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. <laughs> And, and you know, some, when we think of some of the situations that we have today and some of the things, again, labor unions are trying to change, we have to think about the income inequality, okay? You know, if, if you look back about 40 years ago, uh, what, a, what a CEO, what a, a person who uh, was a, a, a chief executive officer of a corporation, they probably made about 40 uh, times more than a worker, right? Going back to the 1960s. Today, a chief executive officer of a corporation probably makes 400 to 500 times more than a worker. Think about this. Um, the, the president of AT&T, you know, whenever you pay your phone bill, think about this, or your, your internet bill. AT&T. The president of AT&T, a couple of years ago, his yearly salary, what he got in one year, $16 million. $16 million, no? That, that's kind of an obscenity when you think about that. Uh, the same thing with the guy from IBM, you know, all the, when you think of these chief executive officers of these corporations that make all of this money, wh why is that? You know, it's really the people's money when you think about it, and yet they're able to make all of this money, and we had this big uh, meltdown that we had in our society uh, because of these uh, bankers and people that really manage other people's money, and yet they're making all of this money. And we know that this is wrong. At the same time, working people are still struggling to make a living. And uh, those are some of the things that we have to think about. How can we change that, no? How can we do that? And as I said before, well, one way, of course, is labor unions are, are trying to uh, change that. Now, one of the things that we did in California, and I like to brag about California a little bit, one of the things that we did uh, in the election of 2012, we passed a bill to tax the millionaires. Isn't that cool? And we did this on a, on a proposition, we put it on the ballot, and then of course we worked very, very hard to make people vote for it, to get people to vote for it. Uh, so what this law does is if you're a millionaire, you have to pay 3% more in state taxes if you make over a million dollars. If you make half a million dollars, you pay 2% more in state taxes. If you make $250,000 a year, you only pay 1% more. But as a result of that bill that we passed, we were able to bring in over six billion dollars into the state revenues. Six billion dollars. And where did that money go? That money went into education. The majority of that money went to education, and not only that, uh, but because of that extra money that we got, and you know, education budgets had been cut all over the country after the major recession that we had, but then we got extra money for low-income students, English learners, and foster children, and foster children. And that money goes directly to the school districts, and it's a condition of them getting that money directly, they have to include the community, they have to include the students, okay? And they have to include the parents in how they're going to spend that money. So that's uh, some of the stuff that we've done in California that actually could be done here in Texas also. So I kind of really want to advocate that. And we know education is so crucial. Uh, because, again, if we do not have an educated citizenry, then we have the kind of ignorance that we see today uh, that, you know, where people like Donald Trump can become so-called political leaders, and it's all based on ignorance. Because one of the things, of course, part of that ignorance and his attack on immigrants, when we think about immigrants, you know, we like to, I like to tell people, and I hope you do the same thing, when we talk to somebody, just ask them, where did your people come from, right? Where did your people come from? Unless you're Native American, unless you're Native American, your people came from somewhere, right? Your grandparents or your parents, or your they came from somewhere. And this country was built by immigrants. And back in the 1920s, there were more 
foreign born in the United States than there were national born. And guess what? They could all vote. They could all vote. They didn't have to be citizens to vote. They just all voted, all right? Nobody checked to see whether they were citizens or not. They, but now, of course, they have made it very difficult. And I want to say to the Latinos in the audience, guess what? We have to remind them, we didn't cross the border, right? The border crossed us. Let's all say. <laughs> So let's all say it all together. We didn't cross the border. Let's say it. We didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. One more time. Okay, I'll say it first. We didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. We have to remind them. And you know, when they talk about how are we ever going to fix this whole issue about immigration, we have to remind them and we have to look at ourselves in the mirror. Who caused the big issue? After we passed the amnesty bill in 86, everybody said, oh, everything's going to be okay. Uh, people aren't going to be inspired to come across the border anymore. But guess what? Who causes the problem on immigration? We, in the United States of America, are the ones that cause the problem. And I'll tell you why. We had this bill in the Congress called NAFTA, okay? The Free Trade Agreements. The people in Oaxaca, Mexico, the, 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 the peasants over there, those campesinos in those states, Chiapas and Oaxaca, they knew that NAFTA was going to hurt them. And they had huge demonstrations in Mexico when that bill passed. We in the United States, most of us were out to lunch. We didn't even know what was happening because we don't get that news on the evening news, right? On the evening news, we get the crime report. That's what we get, okay? And so people didn't know that what was going on. But what that did, it allowed American companies to go into Mexico, to go into Central America, to go into South America, and set up their corporations there. So all of the profits that come out of those uh, businesses, they come back to the United States. They don't stay in those countries. Think of bananas, OK? How many bananas do we eat every day in the United States? Millions of bananas that we eat. Do the people in Guatemala get the money? No. No? The people in Honduras get the money? No. Who gets the money that we pay for our bananas? Dole, Chiquita Banana. Those are American corporations. They get the money that we spend on bananas. If we can think of all of the bananas that we've eaten, Guatemala should be very, very wealthy. You know? And Honduras and those other countries in, the, in, in Central America, they should be rich just from our bananas. But no, because the money came back here to American corporations. And if we think of what we did with World War II, and I know there's some veteranos in the room, you know, people that are kind of little, maybe younger than me, but they remember, they remember, right? Uh, that after World War II, we defeated Japan and Germany because they were our enemies. But what happened? After World War II, we gave them a lot of money. It was called the Marshall Plan. And they built their corporations, they made them strong, like Toyota, Mitsubishi, you know, Germany, Volkswagen, those were American dollars. And we made those, co those companies, those corporations to this day are very, very strong. And they were strong with American tax dollars. And after we lend them the money, we said, hey, you can keep the money. You don't have to pay us back. But we don't do that with Latin America. With Latin America, I call it economic colonization. We go in there and we take over their economy. And this is so wrong because if we would use our money of the United States, uh, to help countries grow their own resources instead of taking it over, right? That's why we have the wars in the Middle East. Some of you may remember during the peace marches that we had when we were trying to stop the war in Iraq, somebody had a sign and it said, how did our oil get under their sand? <laughs> how did our oil get under their sand? Of all of the millions of dollars that we have spent in the wars over there in Afghanistan and in, in the Middle East, if we would have used that money instead to help those, company, those uh, countries be able to grow their own economies, we wouldn't have a war today, right? And so many people would still be alive and not all of the suffering that is going on. So we have to kind of change and rethink our foreign policies. How can we help other countries of the world and, and not devastate those countries so economically you know, so that then they have to come here to the United States of America. I think that someday we can make that happen, but again, it, it depends on us. And then, and then there, there's some of those countries, they don't want to agree with us. You know, they say, oh, I don't want to go around, along with NAFTA. I don't want to go along with American foreign policies. Then we make them our enemies, like Hugo Chavez, you know? 
You know, Dugo Chavez passed away, but we made him our enemy. Why? Because he said, you know, he had a, 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 a simple idea that we didn't like in the United States. He said, the oil of Venezuela belongs to the people of Venezuela. The oil of Venezuela belongs to the people of Venezuela. <laughs> Evo Morales from Bolivia. You know, we were trying to get the natural gas from Bolivia, and he said, no. The natural gas from Bolivia belongs to the people of Bolivia. It doesn't belong to the people of the United States. And then we don't like them. We make them our enemies. And, and we think of little teeny little Cuba, okay? Little teeny Cuba. That have, we have an economic uh, blockade on Cuba. And what, what does Cuba have that we don't have in the United States? Free education for all of their people. Free medical care for all of their people. If you want to become a doctor, free, you can go to Cuba and you can become a doctor, as long as you come back to your community. So when we think of, of this, these situations, and we think, hey, we are the richest country in the world, in the United States of America. Why cannot our people here have a free education, right? Why, why can't we? Instead, we bogged down our students with all of these student loans. And I think these are things in the future that we have to look for and that we have to work for so that, you know, that we use the money, our resources here in the United States to educate our students free. And instead of using all that money to go to war and to bomb other countries and, and kill people in other countries, that we can use stay that uh, money right here in the United States of America. And the other thing, think about this too. When I was talking about Evo Morales in Bolivia and Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, that they, these countries own their natural resources. There's another country, and I'm going to talk about that country also. It's a little teeny country in Europe. It's, it's a Scandinavian country. It's one of those, um, I want to say the word, socialist. <laughs> so Norway, okay, Norway is this little teeny country. It's a socialist country, and uh, you know how much money they had in their little country over there? They had a surplus of $400 billion, $400 billion. Where did they get all that money? From their oil, from their oil. Now think about how much money would we have in Texas and California and Oklahoma, maybe, if we owned our oil, right? But we don't own our oil. We have a, a, a British Petroleum, you know, we have Shell owned by Amsterdam, the people in, in Holland, you know, or the Netherlands. They own the oil. So think about it, that we do not own our natural resources. We are the only developed country in the world that does not own our natural resources. And the only developed country in the world that does not have a free education for our people. The only developed country in the world that does not have free medical care for all of our people. I know we have this you know, insurance plan that we have now, but we know there's still a the middleman of the insurance companies there. So these, again, are things that we have to think about for the future. And how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, I mentioned education for one is one of the ways, so we have to erase the ignorance because the reason again that we have all this bigotry is people are just plain ignorant. People just don't know. I'm sure a lot of people that are here today didn't know the things that I was talking about right now about you know, how we don't own our natural resources in this country and we don't even kind of think about it because that's kind of the way it's always been and nobody questions it. So we have to fix our educational system. And one of the big fixes that we have to do is to make sure that our educational, educational system is equal and that it really teaches the things that we t need to know, especially about the history of our United States of America and the contributions that people of color have made. Unfortunately, as was mentioned earlier uh, by Ms. Klein, is that a lot of the uh, educational things that, that should be taught are not taught about the labor movement, uh, about uh, the contribution of Latinos, for instance, and Asians and other people, the African Americans. How many people know, for instance, that the White House was built by African American slaves? How many of us know that? You know, this is what needs to be taught. And if we do not teach the contributions of people of color, then our kids uh, will always uh, kind of grow up thinking, well, maybe I don't really belong here. They treat us like, like we're foreigners, or like we're, you know, aliens or something like that. And, uh, and we don't really have that pride that we should have about how our people are the ones that built this country. And what happens to our Anglo kids? You know, they kind of grow up with this whole idea that, that they ha they're special, right? 
and that their people did it all because they don't understand that there were many, many people who built this country and who died to build it. So we really need to get on those school boards, okay, so that we can say ethnic studies and the contributions of our people have got to be part of those studies and labor studies so people will know about the things I talked about, about the labor movement. And yes, we have to also talk about women's studies also, okay? Because uh, we have to teach, uh, we have to teach, uh, but wait, I think we have to have a different way that we teach our young women. And you know, one of the things that uh, unfortunately we teach our young women to be victims in our society. Uh, we are taught, and I'm going to kind of do a little feminist little speech in here, okay? Uh, we are taught as young women uh, that, uh, you know, don't get that white dress dirty, uh, don't climb the tree because you might fall down and hurt yourself. Uh, somebody's going to take care of you, somebody's going to protect you, don't worry about a thing because Prince Charming is on his way. <laughs> and uh, Walt Disney teaches us that, yeah, don't worry because Prince Charming uh, is going to give you a big kiss and he's going to wake you up and you're going to live happily ever after, right? <laughs> and instead, I get up Prince Charming, he te da un besote, he gives you a big old kiss and he puts you to sleep and there goes school, and there goes my career, and then daddy's baby's gone. Ya se fue, okay? Yeah, then, then he's gone. And so we have, to change, uh, we have to change the way that we raise our young women. Because when we think about it, if we think of the animal kingdom, who are the most ferocious and the strongest? Is it the male or the female? Yeah. The female, right? Because we know, We know that the female always has to watch the, the young ones, right? And so we have to change that because we need to make our women strong because we know that the women are the ones that set the pace for the family. You know, they're the ones that bring in uh, all of the uh, philosophies, all of the policies, all of the values of a family, so we have to make our women strong. And when we look at our world today, even in our U.S. Congress right now, we women are probably about 19% of the Congress right now, and I know we're improving a little bit, but it'll still take us about 200 years to get uh, that kind of equality that we need uh, to make sure that we women who are 52% of the population were at least, you know, 50% of the Congress, okay? Because unless we get women in there, we're never going to have the kind of fair legislation that we need. Or as Coretta King said, Unless women take power, we will never have peace in the world. Unless women take power, we will never have peace in the world. And when we talk about women, I'm going to kind of change that word a little bit because I'm going to say the word feminist, okay? Okay, I'm going to change the word because, you know, uh, there's some women that really don't have feminist values, right? And I'm talking about the Sarah Palins of the world, okay? Yeah, they really don't believe that, they don't believe in women's reproductive rights, for instance, that women are the only ones that should have uh, the decision over their own bodies, okay? Who owns a woman's body? Who owns a woman's body? Who owns a woman's body? All right. A woman owns her own body and nobody else, right? Not the church, not the state, not any other person, just a woman. And so women have to be strong because we do not want to be dominated, okay, by anybody else. And we want to be able to make our own decisions about our own careers and we want to be strong. And I want to say to the women, else, especially the young women in the room here, I want to say this, that a lot of times and I'll give you an example. They did uh, this uh, survey of uh, young students on the East Coast in an Ivy League college, and they asked uh, the male students, how many of you think that you're ready to run for office, or you can run for office? 80% of the men said yes, the male students. Then they asked the women students, only 30% of the women said they were ready. You know why? Because we as women, we think that we've got to be know everything, and we've got to be so prepared, and I think some of the men in the room will agree with me on this. And the men say, it's okay, I'll learn on the job, okay? I'll learn on the job. So we have to be uh, women, we have to be a little bit more courageous, right? And be a little bit more willing to take risks. And don't think all the time that we have to know everything because we can learn on the job. And I want to say something too to all of the, I know we have a, a bunch of high school students and thank you very much for coming from such a long way to be here, that it's really, really important to stay in school. 
really important to stay in school. And, and please, if you don't know something, ask for help. And I know sometimes that's against our culture. And there's something in the Latino culture that I want to talk about. Like, you know, when we're little and, and nos dicen, no sean entremetidos, you know how they tell us that? You know, I guess the only good way to translate, it, translate that is say don't be a butinsky, no? But you know what? We have to be entremetidos, okay? We have to go and we have to stick ourselves there in places that maybe the people don't want us to be there. We have to go there. The other thing is that ask for help. If you need some help in some subject or something that's happening in your life, ask for help. And if the first person that you go to doesn't help you, go to somebody else. And if that person doesn't help you, go to somebody else. Eventually, somebody will help you. If you need help in your classes, you know, go to somebody and ask them for help. Because I know sometimes I know da vergüenza, but forget that, okay? The main thing is you have to be aggressive and assertive and go out there and get the help that you need. And if something help happens that you have to drop out of school, come back. You know that song, El J, that says, no hay que llegar primero, pero hay que saber llegar, right? No hay que llegar primero, pero hay que saber llegar. And translated, that means you don't have to be the first one to get there, but you have to know how to arrive, all right? You have to know how to arrive. And for the uh, students here that are in college, I'm going to say to you, and I know you're not going to like what I'm going to say, but please, when you graduate from community college, when you graduate from the university, Go on and get your doctorate degrees also, okay? Go on and get your doctorate degrees also because we need you. <clears throat> like, like the professors that we've seen up here today, we need you uh, to be at those college level upper division uh, classes so that we can get more of our people in school and help them stay in school also. And you know, we, and we have to go out there and fight. And if there's some teacher that's discriminating against you, and I can say that because I went through it myself, my children have gone through it, my grandchildren have gone through it, my great-grandchildren have gone through it. Tíralos a locos, okay, are those teachers that don't respect you, okay? Just know, just know it's their fault and not your fault, okay? Don't take it seriously. When they discriminate against you, say, I know that that person is not an educated person, they're an ignorant person, and just keep on going forward. Don't let anybody stand in your way, don't let anybody put you down, okay? Please, promise me that. Oh, and one more thing, could all the high school kids please stand? All the high school kids please stand, okay? All right, let's give them a big applause. <laughs> and I, I, I want you all to put your little hands up like this, okay? And I want you to take an oath, okay? And this is, this is the oath that I want you to take, okay? No babies until we graduate from college. <laughs> Can you all say, I do? Okay, that's a promise. Don't forget. Okay? That's a promise. You can sit down now. <laughs> so I, I want to go back again to the word feminist. And when I say the word feminist, that means a person, a person who believes in women's reproductive rights, a person who believes in equality in marriage, a person who believe, believes in organized workers and labor unions, a, a person who believes, yes, we do have global warming, right? You know, we do have to take care of our, of our environment, right? And of course, somebody who really believes in, in education. Okay, so the reason I say that word feminist, but that means that the men in the room are also feminists, okay? All the men in the room are also feminists because we believe in reproductive rights for women and in women's rights and in workers' rights and in immigrant rights, okay? And that's what makes us feminists. So uh, the other thing too about education, uh, there was, and I want to quote this uh, great philosopher, his name was Jose Ortega y Gasset, and he wrote a book called The Revolution of the Masses. And this is what he said, if we do not have an educated citizenry, if we do not have the people, el pueblo no está educado, then we have the, those that are the greedy and the corrupt will take control. And that's in a way what's happening with us right now in the United States of America. We know that 
you know, the 1% of the very rich right now have most of the money in our country, and the 99% of the working people do not have that, okay? So that doesn't have to be that way, and we have to change it. So again, education is a way that we uh, are able to change that, and so we've got to fight very hard for education. And when we're talking about education, we need a, an equality education, uh, an equality education, uh, because unfortunately, we are not getting that. My organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, we have just filed a lawsuit against our high school district. Uh, I come from Kern County. It's in the Central Valley of California, where of course all of the crops are grown. And it's kind of something like East Texas, if you know what I mean. It's oil and it's agriculture. And there's a lot of entrenched races in there. And so what's happened there, they suspended close to 3,000 kids out of the high school district. We have the largest high school district in the state of California. And most of them, the vast majority of them were Latinos and African-American kids. The African-American kids were suspended close to 600% higher than white kids. The Latino kids close to 500% higher than the white kids. And so we have filed a lawsuit on that. And we're trying to change that, uh, and not only through the lawsuit, but also through the state legislature. And that is happening in many other parts of, of, of the United States of America, where we have an inequality education. And we know that that really, uh, we, it causes what we call the, the pipeline to prison, no? From the school to the prisons. And what it, that has resulted is that we have the highest prison population uh, in the United States and any country in the world. When we think about India or China, their populations are billions of people. They have billions of people in India, billions of people in China. How is it that we in the United States have more people in prison than those countries? That's crazy. You know, our population is just millions, not billions, and yet we have more people in prison. And so the whole prison system has become, uh, it's, it's a business. And many of the prisons are now, they have the private prison corporation, so they're basically making money. They're making money off of the bodies uh, of our young people, especially, and who's in the prisons? The same people that are being suspended from our schools. It's the, it's the, the blacks, it's the African Americans, and it's, it's the Latinos that are in those prisons, and the poor white people also. They're the ones that are in those prisons. And so we've got to stop that, and we've got to work to change uh, some of those uh, laws. Like in California, uh, we were just able to pass a law uh, to reduce a lot of the felonies that they had that should have been misdemeanors, and they were able to get thousands of people out of the prison system. And even when it comes to some of the drug, and I don't know what your, your statistics are in Texas, but in California, 25% of the people uh, that were in prison were there from marijuana, which is ridiculous. When we think of people that are in prison because of drugs, more people die from alcohol and more people die from tobacco than die from drugs. And yet, you don't put somebody in prison because they're an alcoholic, right? You know, you don't. So those are some of the things, again, that we have to think about changing. Uh, and so when we look at all of these different issues that we have in front of us, then we have to say, well, how do we change it? How do we change all of this? What are the solutions that we need to have? And uh, one of the ways that we've been able to attack some of this is with my foundation, and we're organizing the same way that we did with the United Farm Workers. We meet with people in their homes, uh, six to eight people. We call it a grassroots organizing. We raise money, we hire organizers, we train them, we send them into a community, and each organizer has to meet with 200 people in their homes, okay? And then once we get them in there, we talk to them and we say, these are the problems that we have in our society, but you know, we wanna show you how we've been able to change some of these uh, problems, and then we get the people to volunteer, and they, they go out there, and they do all kinds of great things. I know here in Texas you have the colonias, but we have those little places like that in California also where the people don't have, you know, they don't have kind of the infrastructure that they need. Well, our people have been able to, and I'll give you some examples. One little town, I know some of you maybe know uh, some of these little towns in Kern County, Lamont, California. They now have 18 streets that have curbs, sidewalks, and gutters. They have also another little town called Weed Patch. This is where the Grapes of Brass was filmed, by the way. They have now uh, a gymnasium that they were able to get for their school, passing a bond issue. Uh, we've gotten 45 homes there that are now hooked up to, uh, to sewers that they didn't have before. And guess what, a neighborhood park, okay, that the people petitioned for and got for themselves. In Lamont, we also have a swimming pool uh, that people were able to get. And they did all of this work by themselves by going door to door, by registering people to vote, by getting the people out to vote. Uh, just recently, uh, we passed a, 
a tax, uh, uh, for a kind of a base of taxes so that uh, for our local school district, a quarter of a million dollars for our local school district. Uh, but the people do all of the work. We've gotten people, oh, this is the greatest thing, they have gotten themselves elected to different offices. Wendell Town there, Arvin, California, is now controlled uh, by young people under the age of 25 years old, okay? They have the majority of the people on the city council, and they're doing all kinds of great things, uh, you know, bringing in more money into the city. We have people that have taken over the water board, and these are, we call them vecinos, vecinos unidos, and these are just regular people, you know, farm workers, and they're taking over these, these positions, taking over the water board, taken over the recreation board, and we've got four of our people now also on the different school boards, okay? To start to change that. And so what we're doing there, we can basically do it everywhere, and we just gotta get the people to volunteer and to get out there. And one of the sad things about Texas, when you think about how far behind we are, and I wanna give you another example of, of an election that happened in the state of, of Virginia. You know, you think of Virginia? Are there any Latinos in Virginia? Yeah. 7%, 6 to 7%. Well, the governor of Virginia in this last election, he won with the Latino vote in the state of Virginia. How did that happen? Okay, well, there was a guy who was running against him, and he said, immigrants are like ratas, they're like rats, and you need pesticides to get rid of them. Well, this organization I belong to, People for the American Way, they made an ad about what he said about the immigrants. Well, the state of Virginia has, what, six to seven percent Latinos? Well, the governor of Virginia, Terry McCullough, he got elected with 53,000 votes. You know how many Latinos voted? 63,000. He got elected with 53,000 votes, 63,000 Latinos voted in that state where they only represent six to seven percent. How many Latinos do we have in the state of Texas? 40%, 50%, okay. I think that that's an example. I mean, we know that in the last presidential election, President Obama never would have won had not the Latinos voted for him, right? It was a Latino vote, it was a woman's vote that got President Obama elected. So, and, and when I'm looking at all of you here, and I'm seeing how, much, how many people we have in this room, uh, the, your people you are here today because you want to talk about the social issues uh, that are going on in our community. And, you know, I, I just want to say to you this too, is that when we started organizing the farm workers and people told us, how are you going to organize the farm workers? They're poor. They don't speak English. They're not citizens. They don't have any money. How are you going to organize them? And we said, the power that they have is in their person. And that's what we told the workers. The power is in your person. This is all the power that you need. The power is in your person. But you can't do it unless we all come together and we all take direct action, nonviolent action, no? And this is the way that we win. And so we talk about the laws that we passed for the farm workers. We talk about the amnesty law, the laws I talked about. It was, it was done by the people going out there and knocking on doors and educating people how to vote and, and motivating, motivating them that they have to vote. And this is a way that, they, that we win. And they did that. They did that. So if we did it in California, you know, we have really a progressive government in California we just passed, by the way, another bill I forgot to mention to you. Of course, we got the driver's license for undocumented. And we also just passed the, for the, uh, for the uh, Affordable Care Act. It now covers undocumented people also. Health care for all in California covers the undocumented people. We just passed that law right now. So I know in, in California we have less Latinos than we have in Texas, okay? So, you know, we, we can make it happen here in Texas. We can make it happen. Texas right now, in terms of the voter turnout, is 49th out of 50 states. You are next to the bottom. That is not acceptable. That is not acceptable. And, and you know who can change that? Who can change it? Okay, we can change it. We're 55 million Latinos in the United States of America. But if we do not organize, if we do not vote, you know, then we're invisible. 
It's like we didn't exist. And not only that, but you have all of these people who we've all seen those Republican debates and on the top of their agenda, they don't want immigration reform, right? They, you know, they're coming out with all of this racist rhetoric, especially attacking uh, the, the Mexican people, you know, especially attacking the Mexican people. And we can't let them get away with that. Well, there's a way to get even. There's a way to get even, and it's a really easy way. And we have, we have a weapon, a very strong weapon. And it doesn't have to be a gun or a rifle. La pluma, you know, the pencil, to take it into that voting booth and to mark that ballot, you know? And I know, <laughs> and I know sometimes, you know, uh, we get frustrated. And you know, sometimes when I come to text on people, and la gente me dice, oh, we're not, Amer we're not Americans and we're not uh, Mexicans, we're Texans. And I sometimes say, well, you know what? If you don't vote, están tapados, right? <laughs> you know, vote tapados. <laughs> and I know sometimes our people, we have to, I say, sometimes we have to be invited, you know? We have to be invited to vote, and sometimes people, they don't vote because they get this big, long ballot, and they're afraid that they're going to make a mistake, you know, that they're going to make a mistake, and so they don't want to make a mistake, and so they don't vote at all. So we have to say to people, just vote what you know about. You don't have to worry about anything else, you know. Vote what you know, you can leave the rest of the ballot blank, and then, you know, ask for help. You know, we have that thing in our culture that we don't like, that. we have that false orgullo, you know that false pride that we don't want to ask for help. Ask for help, there's people out there that will help you and they will instruct you and help you vote. But we have to really do that. I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question right now. I'm gonna, in fact, I'm gonna ask you three or four questions, okay? One of them I'm gonna ask you, how many of you know who your state representative is? Raise your hand. Okay, that's really pretty good, okay? Uh, how many of you know who your congressperson is? All right. How many of you know who your state senator is? Okay, all right, that's really good. Um, and uh, how many of you know who your U.S. Senator is? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> Senators are, I should say, because there's two of them. And I, I know you all know who the President is, okay, so I'm going to ask that question. Now I'm going to ask another question. How, how many of you voted in the last election? Pretty good showing, okay. And I know some of the high school students are not of age yet to vote, okay. Uh, uh, now, this is another really important question. How many of you help other people to vote by going out and knocking on doors or doing phone banking? Okay, our numbers went down a lot. So, so uh, by the way, for the high school students, I want to say this. Don't think that you're too young to help on voting. One of the times, you know, I was in jail a whole bunch of times, right? For, 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 for talking to farm workers. Uh, not, not for any criminal activity, but just going to talk to workers or be on the picket line, they would put us in jail. So I've been in jail about 20 times, all right? Yeah. But uh, one of the times when I was in jail, uh, I was coming out of jail, and there was a group of young students that were greeting me as I came out of the jail, and one of them handed me a note, and it was from my 13-year-old daughter, Angela. And uh, the note said, Mom, I'm sorry I can't be there to, to greet you uh, because uh, I'm busy knocking on doors to get out the boat my 13-year-old daughter. So all of you young people out there that are here, the high school students, you can really make a lot of difference because everybody that goes out and knocks on doors to get people out to vote, you can actually get maybe from uh, 10 to 40 people to vote. You know, even though you can't vote yourself, you can get out there and help. And by the way, when we talk about going out door to door to get people out to vote, I call that organizing 101. This is how I really got involved with the farm worker movement because when I was going out there knocking on doors, I came to the house of a farm worker and they didn't have nothing but a dirt floor and they had cardboard furniture, you know, and orange crates. And I got so angry when I saw that that it made me really, really mad. I thought I have to do something. And then afterwards when I was teaching school, and then kids came into my classroom and they were hungry and they needed shoes and uh, I would go argue with my principal. By the way, these were little white kids, they were the little oaky kids, you know. And my principal was from Arkansas and he said, oh, their, their family, all they do is drink up all their money, you know. And I knew that was wrong because I knew how, how hard the farm workers worked and then they were not getting paid for what they needed to do. And so that's what really got me into organizing. So when you go out there and you knock on doors and you talk to people, it really builds up your, your, your self-confidence. I call it Leadership 101, Leadership 101. 
And you know, so we have, we have uh, such an army at our disposal that we could really change uh, this country, the United States of America, and we could make it a country of justice. Every month, pick up on this figure, every month in the United States of America, 50,000 Latino kids graduate from high school. 50,000 every month in the United States of America, 50,000 Latino kids graduate from high school. So we have so much power. And we have our numbers, just by our numbers, we have so much power that we, we can decide every election in Texas. And on the, on the presidential level, we can decide the election. We can decide who is going to be the next president of the United States of America. We, right here. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So I'm going to ask you a question right now. And I'm going to ask you, who's got the power? And I, and I want you to yell back, we've got the power. And when I say, what kind of power? I want you to say people power. OK, so I'm going to shut it out. Who's got the power? power. What kind of power? People power. OK, some people aren't sure. <laughs> So let's do that one more time, and let's do it really, really loud. I'm going to say, I'm going to yell it out. I'm going to say, who's got the power? And I want you to shout really, really loud like you really, really mean it, okay? Who's got the power? We have the power. What kind of power? People power. Now we're going to say it one more time, but then when I say what kind of power, I want you to say voting power. Voting power, okay? I'm going to say, who's got the power? You say, we got the power. And then I say, what kind of power? Voting power, okay? Who's got the power? We have the power. What kind of power? We power. Now, can we, all of us here, and I know Corpus Christi is a really a special place. This is where LULAC was founded. I guess the first chapter by Dr. Hector Garcia was right here in, uh, in Corpus Christi. So here from Corpus Christi, and the people that come in here from South Texas over here, so we can spread this all over the state of Texas, just like the farm worker movement started in this little, little teeny rural farm worker town called Delano, California, and went out throughout the United States of America, and we were able to change these major laws. Starting here from Corpus Christi, Texas, we can say right now, we are going to take this fight for social justice. We're gonna make, take Texas from being at the bottom of the pile, okay, on everything, to make it at the top of the pile, because Texas has always been, want, you always say, in number one, okay? Okay, so we can really make it number one in social justice, okay? So we can take it right here from Corpus Christi, and we go throughout the state of Texas and say, we have the power to change Texas, right? We have the power to change Texas and make it the number one state in social justice, maybe even better than California. Okay, we can make that happen. So let's say it again. Who's got the power? We have the power. What kind of power? power. Voting power. And then we can make, we don't have to have like an armed revolution, you know, with guns and stuff like that, because we have the voting power uh, that we can make this happen. And I think we can really make it happen because we don't have to be ashamed. I know Texans are very proud. I know when the Texans come to California, they bring their culture, they bring the music, the energy. La gente tejana, they have so much energy. And whenever they show up anywhere, they make it different, right? They make it a lot better, uh, you know, a, a more joyful place. But we've got, it's, we've got to be more than joyful, everybody. We've got to uh, really work for justice, and we can make it happen here, uh, happen here in Texas. Uh, so before, so I'm going to, and one of the things that we can do, and I'm going to talk to some of the teachers in the room, uh, all of these students that are here, and some of the teachers here in the community college, you can give your students credit. You know, they can go out there and register as voters and on a nonpartisan basis, you don't have to tell them who to vote for. Just important for them to get to the polls and not just register them to vote. You know, some of this stuff where they go out there, they pay money to people to register vote. We don't want people to just be registered. We want them to be educated, no? We want them to be educated. I was in San Antonio until the sad story. I was in San Antonio during the last election and I went down one street that everybody was registered to vote. But you know what, when you talk to them, a la brava, they would say to me, we don't vote. Like they were proud of it. What's up with that, you know? They would say, we don't vote. What do you mean you don't vote? We have to have a responsibility here. We want to have a democracy. If people don't vote, the haters win. 
The haters will win. Those that don't like us, those that are against immigrants, those that are against feminists, against women, those that are against our, our, uh, our uh, LGBT community, our gay, lesbian, and transgender community, you know, they are the ones that are going to win. And why? Because if we don't vote, it's like, you know, we're giving them, we're giving up, you know, we're giving up. Say, no, you, you can have it. You know, you can have all of the policies and the practices that go on in our country because we're too lazy to vote or we're too scared to vote, or we're too intimidated to vote. So we have to realize that the only way we can change it, like the farm workers did, all the poor farm workers did over there, the only way that we can change it is by us getting out there and making sure. The other thing too, uh, one of the things that we have to, of course, erase the ignorance of racism, and there's one way that we can do that also. And I hope that when I ask this question, people know the answer. What is the name of our human race? Somebody shout it out. Homo sapiens, I heard it from there. Homo sapiens, okay. That is our scientific name of our human race, right? Okay, uh, and where did our human race begin? Africa, don't we all know this? Our human race began in Africa. And that means that we in this room are all Africans of different shades and colors. Yes we are, yes we are. Because our human race, you know, we, we started in Africa and then we went across the planet and uh, we went to Asia and we got lighter in skin and then we came down to the Bering Strait uh, to the Americas and one of our tribes got lost and they went way up north where it's really, really cold and they lost their color, pobrecitos, you know, they lost their color <laughs> and now yeah, they have to go to the tanning salon or they got to go to the beach to get their color back, you know. And so we can take, we can say to the, uh, to the White Citizens Council and to the KKK, uh, get over it, you're Africans, okay? Just get over it, okay? <laughs> Stop the racism. And I actually had my own DNA done, by the way, you know, there was some uh, television station in Los Angeles, they were doing DNA and they came over to, after one of my speeches and they swabbed my cheeks and when they came back uh, and they asked me, who do you think you are? Well, I know on my mother's side, I'm from New Mexico, by the way, and on my mother's side of the family, you know, my grandmother was uh, French and Spanish and my grandpa, my great grandmother came from Sevilla, but on my dad's side, they came from Mexico, from Zacatecas and Durango. So I said, well, probably I'm about 60% European and 40% uh, indigenous. And then when they came back, I was 65% European and 35% indigenous. And I asked them, did my Africanness show up? And they said, yes, it was 0.003%. My Africanness was in there. But then they told me, but you know what? You're also part Neanderthal. I said, what? Because <laughs> I guess only people from Europe are Neanderthal, so I had 0.005 Neanderthal also, okay? <laughs> so that, that was kind of. So one way that, uh, again, uh, we can remember that we are all Africans, that means que so, todos somos familia, okay? We're all family. We're related to Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah, we're related to Obama, nuestro primo, Obama, you know? Uh, we're related to uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, we're related to Pope Francis, okay? Uh, you know, those are all our parientes, those are all our relatives. And when we know that, that means that we all have to work together and we have to protect each other, you know, and support each other. And so I'm gonna share a word with you. It's a word from South Africa, and it means we, the people, of Texas are coming together to fight for justice. The word is Wozani. Can you say that word? Wozani. Okay, so again, I'm gonna say it first and I want you to shout it out really loud. Wozani. So I'm gonna say one, two, three. Let's all shout out. Nuestra familia, we're gonna shout out the word Wozani. Okay, I'm gonna go. One, two, three. Wozani. One more time. One, two, three. Wozani. Okay, and now let's do some vivas. Let's do some vivas, so uh, to celebrate our people who have been with us in the past and uh, all of us who are still fighting for the future, okay? So the first one I'm going to say is, of course, for Cesar Chavez, uh, who fought, you know, for everybody. You know, Caesar, uh, he never uh, went to high school. He never had that option. He only went to grammar school, but he always learned. He always had a book under his arm. And we know he did a lot of fast for justice. He did to give her the pesticides that we know that have harmed so many of our farm workers and so many of the people in our country. His last fast was for 36 days, water only with Holy Communion uh, to fight against pesticides. And someday, another thing we have to change, all of the use of pesticides 
we want to put that under the health department, right? Take it out of agriculture, take it out of the EPA, and put it under uh, the Health and Human Services so we can stop the misuse of poisons on our, on our farm workers and also on our food that cause so much cancer. We have the number one, our country has the number one cancer rate of all of the world because of all of the stuff that they put in our food and we have to eventually end that. By the way, I'm a vegetarian. Okay, put that up. <laughs> Cut down on the meat, okay? Cut down on the meat and that'll help you out. So let's say a big old viva for Cesar Chavez. I'll say it, uh, I'll say it first. I'm going to say que viva Cesar Chavez and everybody shout viva, okay? Que viva Cesar Chavez! Viva! Uh, que viva Dr. Hector Garcia! Viva! Que viva los campesinos! Viva! Que viva los emigrantes! Viva! Que viva los dreamers! Viva! Okay, que viva los feministas! Viva! Yeah. So can we go out there and can we make Texas the number one state in social justice? Se puede o no se puede? Okay, so let's do that with an organized hand clap. All together, let's go. Si se puede. Thank you. And uh, the president of LULAC just raised his, uh, the flag over there, so let's say a big old viva for LULAC also. Que viva LULAC! Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we have time for some questions. Oh, by the way, while the questions come up here, I just want to say to all the women in the room, I'm the one that came up with Cisapa, they're not Caesar. <laughs> Okay, um, so there are some questions that were um, turned in, and some of the questions can actually be answered at the panel uh, tomorrow, so we're reserving those, but I have a few questions here. The first one is, um, you have stood up for so much throughout your life. What is the one moment when you were the most afraid for your life? Thank you, sister. Mm. Uh, well, there, I had uh, some terrifying moments while organizing uh, one time, uh, when uh, someone came to my door at four o'clock in the morning and they knocked on the door and uh, they said, uh, I said, who is it? They said, Helen Chavez sent me, that's Caesar's wife. And so I thought, oh my God, something must have happened to Caesar. And it was really interesting because I had actually been in New York City working on the great boycott. So hardly anybody knew that I was back in Delano. And when I went to open the door, well, I, let me go back a little bit. I have one of my sons, Emilio, who is now an attorney, uh, he made me put the latch on the door and, and put the lights on, and, which basically I wouldn't have done that, and you know, make sure I had the porch lights on and all that. And uh, anyway, when I went to open the door, this person came and tried to push the door open, but the door snapped back because it was locked. And then, uh, then I got scared, and then uh, the person outside, they went and they got a rock, and then they broke this big picture window uh, you know, and my son was sleeping right under that picture window and he jumped up. And so I was there by myself with my, with my kids and uh, went, went into the bathroom. I was shaking so hard. I mean, my whole body was just shaking because my kids were there. And I locked myself in the bathroom and thinking, what am I going to do? I didn't have anything to protect myself. Uh, but uh, that they kept going around and around my house. And I put my son out through the little window in the bathroom to see if he could go get the help for us. And, uh, we, well, the person, we, oh, by the way, we also locked, went really quickly and locked all the, all the windows and the back doors so that they couldn't get in the house. But we found out later that it was a, uh, one of the foremen from this company uh, called Jamara, which was a big grape company, the biggest grape company. And uh, they're the ones that, that, this, that were terrorizing my house. I found out later that they had done the same thing, exact thing to a woman here in Texas. One of the farm workers from Texas who used to migrate to California, that they went to her house too and they broke her windows of her house and terrorized her. And I was just really, really scared because of my kids were there. But I think that was the one time that I really, really got terrified. And I was also, by the way, I forgot to mention this, but I don't, that any of the money that we raise here today from the honorariums, I do not keep that money. That money goes to my organization, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, to help us continue the organizing that we uh, need. And I guess this is the other time I was more scared. Uh, and the reason is because I was beaten up 
uh, by the uh, police in San Francisco. And uh, we were actually picketing George Bush the first in a rally uh, because, oh, he had come out and said that there was nothing wrong with pesticides. And this is right after Caesar ended that last fast I was talking about, his 36 day water only fast. And so uh, Caesar went off to recuperate and we just went out there, we were starting another boycott against the pesticides. And uh, well, boycott of grapes until they stopped using the pesticides. And uh, I would, so there was a rally in San Francisco and uh, we were there uh, protesting uh, George Bush. He was having a big fundraiser. And it was really kind of an, uh, a fun kind of an event because a lot of people, they had big signs that said, uh, Bush Noriega. Uh, Noriega was, was the president of Panama who used to work for the CIA. And uh, everybody was saying Bush Noriega, that's the ticket, you know, the presidential ticket. And there was a lot of labor people there and they were chanting, uh, get out of El Salvador, that's when the United States where we were dropping bombs on, on the people of El Salvador at that time. And so there were all these kinds of signs and then some of the gay community was there and they were dressed in drag and they had big signs saying Bush is a drag, and walking up and down. <laughs> but so anyway, this policeman came and he beat me, he hit me from the back and he actually hit me so hard that he broke my ribs, uh, tore my ribs and uh, my, my spleen, which is an organ that we have, was, was burst. He hit me so hard they never found it, just pieces of it. And well, as a result of that uh, beating, I almost died, by the way, and after the result of that beating. But then uh, we sued the San Francisco Police, Police Department for that beating. And, but as a result of that beating, like they say in Spanish, no hay nada mal que algo bien no sale, okay? Uh, as a result of that beating, uh, we sued the San Francisco Police, and they have to give me $2,000 until I die, okay? <laughs> so, I'm uh, 85 years old and I plan to live as long as I can, but <laughs> so that plus my social security, which is minimal, I get $600 a month social security because in the Farmworkers Union we never got wages, we just got subsistence. Uh, but because of that, uh, then I can continue to keep working and uh, all of the money that I raise goes to the foundation to hire more organizers, right? So we can build more communities, more community strength. Actually, that's a really great lead into a question that we received from one of the audience members is, uh, uh, what is your take on the abundance of documented police brutality and excessive force in the recent years, namely Ferguson, Baltimore, New York, and then there's et cetera. So. Well, we know that that's something that has got to be, again, uh, it's got to be brought in, reined in, because there's too many people, uh, even uh, 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 in Los Angeles, for instance, I think, up to date, they have killed up 30 people have, have been killed in Los Angeles. In our own community of the Kurd County, they have also killed a whole bunch of people. I think we're up to about 16 or something like that. Not only, uh, most of them of course are black and brown, although there's a few white people that have also been killed, the people that have uh, been uh, died in custody. But uh, who does the police department work under? Usually the city councils, right? Now, the sheriffs work under the Board of Supervisors. So that's why, again, we've got to make sure that we get people elected to those positions. No, not just the persons at the state legislature, but let's go after those school boards, let's go after those city councils, because they're the ones that the, the police work under, and that's the way, the way that we make those changes, uh, to be able to stop some of the police brutality and the police slayings, of, uh, especially of people of color. I have uh, three more questions. Mm -hmm. so. Um, how was being involved with the UFW different for women than for men? Well, I think the women were always at the front lines of the picket lines uh, because of, we had the kids also that were at the front lines. They were, the women were always at the front lines of the picket lines. They were always there with their children. I think the one area, and we did work on it, I said to myself, and people would ask Caesar, why do you have so many women working in different positions in the union? And he would say, because they do the work, right? The women do the work. But again, you know, the machismo, as we know, is always alive and well. Uh, and so, you know, we always had to keep fighting uh, uh, to make sure that the women uh, were respected and that the women were recognized for the work that they do. And by the way, the current president of the United Farm Workers is from Texas, Arturo Rodriguez, okay? He's from San Antonio. And I, I do believe he has a majority of women now on his executive board. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to combine these because they kind of share a theme, but uh, what advice would you give to people who live in conservative cities and states that want to build unions but feel intimidated or hopeless? And there was other people talking about um, 
how do you keep from being discouraged in work environments that don't that are oppressive? Well, that's two different questions, and I can actually say that I'm one of those people that lives in a conservative, conservative area. Uh, Kern County, uh, where I live, is the most conservative county in the state of California. That's why I say it's something like Selma, Alabama, or it's something like East Texas here, uh, because it's oil and it's agriculture, and we have these systems, I call them systems of oppression. And what we're doing is we're working uh, to try to dismantle some of those systems, and we're trying to do it through the electoral system, through an electoral revolution. You know, we, we now have uh, a Latino assembly person uh, that is representing us. Uh, we have uh, one Latina on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, we're filing a lawsuit on the gerrymandering that they did because we should have had two Latinos on the Board of Supervisors. There's something like what you call your commissioners here. You know, so we're working from the inside. And sometimes they say to people, uh, they used to say, you can't get anywhere unless you get out of the Central Valley of California. And my answer is no, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay there and we're going to organize and we're going to keep organizing the people so we can change it from within. So we don't have to leave. We just have to stay there and try constantly to educate people and do it uh, through, through the political system of electing people at the different areas. Uh, on, our, on our city, on our grammar school board right now, uh, which again is a very, very large school district. We now have three progressive Latinos on the city school board, okay? Now we're trying to change the high school board also. So it's just by organizing and don't give up. Don't give up, okay? Because as Cesar used to say, the only time we lose is when we quit. We just have to keep working and educating people until we're able to get the kind of justice that we need for our people. And um, it says, what do you believe to be the next civil rights frontier, and how has the advent of technology changed organizing for better or for worse? Well, I do believe, as I said before, I think the education issue is our civil rights issue of today, okay? The voting and the education issue is our civil rights issue of today, uh, and that's, I think, what we have to put a lot of our attention on right now. Later on down the road, of course, the police brutality issues are civil rights issues also, and also, we have to start working uh, for the women and the, not just the women, but the families to make sure eventually that we get universal early childhood education for all of our children, okay? So our kids can get that education early. And uh, by the way, New York City, New York City has just mandated early childhood education for 64,000 children in New York City, all right? So if they can do it in New York, we can do it in Texas, we can do it in California, definitely. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for your wonderful attention and for coming all the way over here to see us, and I hope you all have a very safe trip home, okay? And don't forget, que si se puede, si se puede, everybody. Mr. Los Otra vez, one more unified hand clap, let's go, si se puede. Thank you, gracias, thank you. Thank you everyone for coming, thank you.